Yeah. All right, everyone. It is 9 01. We're ready to get started. As we get started, uh, thank you to Rick Leinbach for allowing us to use his space here at Startup Portal. Um, also, thank you to American Ice Cafe for providing coffee and to uh, Dean Burr Baking Company for the uh, sweet treats and helping us kick off. Um, so, so as we uh, as we always do uh, Wednesday morning, I'm going to just introduce one million cups and what we're all about here. Where do I go to take the play? Not working. That's hidden. Let's go ahead and start clicking. Ah, all right. Okay. Thought I had to be pre presented. All right. So, the mission of 1MC Westminster is to lower the barrier for access to education, resources, and connections for entrepreneurs. Without our great community here, uh, everybody on uh, Facebook Live, um, and of course, our core pillars, we cannot accomplish this mission. We're looking for presentations, not pitches. Uh, we're all about connection, not networking. Um, we really are for the community, by the community. We want to get to know you, your business, uh, your organization, so that we can connect you to all the great people that we have here. Nobody has ownership of 1MC Westminster. Nobody is paid to do 1MC Westminster, and we are radically and intentionally inclusive. We meet every week. Wednesdays at 9 a.m. We're also uh, we also have uh, the recordings on YouTube if you want to catch it after the fact. Um, we have two presenters whenever possible. Uh, we just ask that presenters' organizations be less than five years old and willing to ask for help because we end every presentation with "What can we as a community do to help you?" And here's our organizing team: Graham Dodge of Magic, Chris Abel of the Carroll Technology Council. Uh, Vicki Slinkman of Ting, John Wheatman of what is it? The Entrepreneur Story. Entrepreneur Story, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tina Thomas of uh, the Infinite Love Project, myself, Julia Snap, the CEO of Original Systems, and Gabby Rose, also of Magic. And with that, I will pass it pass it to uh, Meridian Health and Ashwarya. Ash 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 I know I've been murdered again. All right, let me stop sharing. So, Ashwarya, you can share your screen now. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much for having me. It is so nice to be here today. Good morning to everyone. I wish I could be there in person. Unfortunately, I cannot. Um, but yeah, really excited to talk about my company Meridian today. Um, all right. Can everybody see that? Yes, yes. we can hear you just fine. Perfect. Good morning. Okay. So to get right into it, um, I'm building Meridian Health, which is AI-enabled healthcare access for young adults, especially 18 to 26-year-olds. So I grew up in California, and my family's idea of a good time of the weekend was a bike ride or camping or going hiking. I had two marathon runners for parents. I was a competitive swimmer my entire life. And um, and as a result, I was forced to be really, really healthy. I knew exactly what I had to do at any given time to sleep right, to eat right. There was always a routine. And when I went to college, I really expected this routine to fall right into place. But instead, I was met with... Um, over the next four years, I would go to the urgent care clinic twice. Um, I would have countless friends ending up in the hospital. Um, I had, you know, like friends who had STI tests, abortions, just unequal access to healthcare in general. And as a result, realized that it's really difficult to access healthcare when you're in college. To put more numbers to this, um, it costs universities about $15 billion a year just through retention, and about 21% of students who drop out drop out due to health care reasons. Um, when you dive even deeper into this and the factors for this, when you think about food insecurity and reproductive health, especially in more underserved communities, people who come from poor socioeconomic backgrounds and are empowered by being in college are still unable to access healthcare resources as well as their um, counterparts. And so we've started to uh, build a system uh, that was more equitable using technology and to actually improve this current health seeking experience that takes anywhere from eight to 10 weeks to actually get care. 
Um, this includes a lot of delays in wait time between actually um, understanding that you need care to receiving it, um, booking, a, booking an appointment, not being able to do anything while you're waiting. Um, and as a result, it leads to larger chronic conditions in the future as the National Institute Journal of um, Medicine actually found out. So in early 2020, we actually built our very first, very rudimentary JavaScript chatbot. It was just a couple of students and we wanted to offload a lot of the traffic that was coming in through the COVID hotlines because people were asking questions about, you know, like, what does this resource mean? How do I access it? How do I book an appointment? And this hotline was only supposed to really be for COVID guidelines, but we realized that people just wanted very quick answers to their questions. They didn't want to book an appointment. They didn't want to go to the health center. And so as a, a lower acuity way of answering their questions, on the other end of the line was just us. We told them to text a chat bot. Um, and in just two months, we got over 4,000 queries. And we realized that you know, there's a huge need here for stigma, judgment-free, anonymized answers um, that you know, only take 30 seconds to get an answer for. These long, times, uh, long wait times and not a single point of entry, that fragmentation really delays people in getting, especially young adults who don't have chronic urgent care conditions to keep on delaying the care that they need. So we built a platform. This is the student facing side of the platform. Um, basically, a one single point of entry into every healthcare resource on and off campus that they can use. And this would be a conversational AI LLM that we created um, using, you know, a lot. Now, I think a lot of people, because of ChatGP, really understand the value of how. Um, of how a quick response and a tailored response can really change your perspective on things, how much more efficient you can be. And so we've really focused on especially enabling patient provider relationships and health literacy at the youngest ages possible. Um, but then we also realized that for universities, while they wanted to help students and they wanted to be there um, for them in ways that, you know, like their parents, for example, couldn't be, um, they just didn't have enough data transparency. And this created a lot of problems, especially in a school as big as the University of Maryland that has, you know, 40,000 people on campus. And so we built a data analytics dashboard for them with this unique data that we were able to gather from, um, from being able to directly communicate with students. And this would be tracking referrals and outcomes, um, doing this care management and actually figuring out from the first time that someone asks a question all the way to them seeking care. What did that journey look like? What, um, what kind of questions were they asking along the way? And how can um, universities support them more in that process? So as of last month, we actually, launched an open access beta test to all um, to five campuses in the University System of Maryland. Um, this is four of them, but uh, Maryland is a very interesting place. There's 13 universities in just the Baltimore area alone. Um, and then in the DMV altogether, there's 108 four-year universities. Um, and so we really, really wanted to focus on that health equity and underserved communities part. Um, and so that's that this ability to test um, directly with students has given us a lot of insight into our upcoming three contracts that are happening in the fall um, with Norfolk State University, Alabama A&M, and North Carolina Central. So our um, what we're currently working towards is um, a contract with specifically the UMD Mental Health Task Force um, and the Morgan State Center for Urban Health Equity. Um, these centers are put specifically into place during COVID in order to ensure that, you know, like there are better ecosystems around especially young adults. Um, but we know that it doesn't just stop there. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about the founding team because I think we have built really the perfect team to execute on something like this. Um, I grew up in the startup world. Um, I was, you know, first employee at what is now a Series A company. Um, 
and spent a lot of time doing not only for-profit but non-profit work as well. Um, we have a founding engineer. She does a lot of the NLP um, data science on the chatbot part. And we also have a fractional chief health equity officer who has uh, over 25 years in the university health space and actually used to be the director of four university health systems before including Penn State and um, North Carolina Central as well as being uh, supported by some really amazing subject matter experts in public health who have previously worked at the CDC, at Healthy, at the NIH, um, and they really support our day-to-day -day operations and us, you know, really having the best outcomes possible. But we know that like universities are just one key component of the ecosystem. It's so much more than that. It's interoperability of healthcare data, which is something that is being worked on in the healthcare system as a whole, but it really, really affects students because they are this next generation who expects to have all of this data at the tips of their fingers. Um, and so we're building a better way to engage with urgent care clinics, with their primary care uh, physicians, as well as pharmacies in the area. And lastly, something that we've just started working with is we know that, especially in COVID, um, a lot of care had gone virtual. Um, and we want to ensure that we're helping universities utilize these telehealth services in the best way possible, while also being able to track um, uh, student utilization of them and being able to provide them uh, to students in the best way possible. So we've also began um, doing more data integration um, through those digital health companies as well. Um, and so, yeah, in order to ensure the next generation of healthy adults, we're really, really focused on our mission of um, health literacy, empowering and destigmatizing accessing care um, and getting better access, easier access, more convenient access um, to, to resources that really meet students where they are at the moment. So yeah, thank you. Great job, Ashwarya. I wish there was a mic drop icon you could, you know, share right now. That was awesome. All right. So we're, we have people on Facebook Live. We have people here in the room. So we'll just open up to anyone who has questions. If you are watching on Facebook Live, please just put your questions in the comments. And Gabby here will read them out loud. They might want to kick us off with any questions for Ashwarya. Uh, Tina, go ahead. I think you can see you. Yeah, I think I need to go right here. Hi, good morning. Um, so the it's a very amazing thing that you're doing. I have a lot of thoughts around it, but the main question I have is it appeared that you have a physical health component, mental health component, you're doing good plugins. Is there a preventative care component? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I only had, um, I still went over time and I still didn't feel like I had enough time, but the way that this initially started was um, that as a public health research project and as a data science major, my my role was really to look at these, you know, huge data sets of public health data and go through, you know, chronic health conditions like diabetes, heart conditions. And the way that this was born was we wanted to know what this looked like at the earliest stages, like when we were really upstreaming healthcare taking in these social determinants. And so V1 of our chatbot was just to increase preventative health utilization, like HPV vaccines. And then in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it became more about like access to vaccines and boosters for COVID specifically. Um, and so, yes, there's definitely a preventative health component. Um, this also includes preventative health resources that the university has already made, and we're just kind of facilitating that reaching students faster. And just a, a follow-up question is, it sounds like it's very um, Western medicine oriented. Uh, do you have any um, plugins for alternative uh, healthcare practices, um, yeah. you know, uh, diet health, uh, physical, you know, yoga, things of that yeah. nature? That's a great question. Um, my family is extremely spiritual. And so they have also asked me the same thing. Um, I think <laughs> the... The vision would be to expose, especially this new generation, to every type of medicine out there. We have focused pretty clinically on three to begin with, and this is like three flows to begin with. That's like mental health, sexual health, and medication adherence, because that is what, at the moment, like are the biggest, I guess, 
Western medicine problems. Um, as we grow, because we're selling directly to universities, it's really about, um, I think, uplifting university resources. And most of those, unfortunately, would be more Western medicine. Um, I think there is a, a direct to consumer approach to this, right? Where we give people better access to just healthcare information on the internet as well. And that could mean like more equitable access to different types of healthcare. Um, for example, like in Indian medicine, like Ayurveda is what comes first, right? Before you ever go to the doctor. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, that's a good, great question. Um, I wish I knew exactly what the roadmap to something like that would be, but I hope that it's something that we can integrate in the future. I would just comment on that, what that roadmap may be. I was watching a presentation on Web3 principles and um, what people are now referring to, I think is plurality or pluralism in AI. And the concept being that there are always gonna be opposing viewpoints, right? And that the AI be built with that plural, pluralism or plurality in it so that it can always present the sort of counter point or counter argument when it's providing uh, advice. Um, and I know that ChatGPT sort of does that well too. A more broader perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question about who you are selling to. So as you grow, and it's amazing, and I love how you have bloomed where you are planted here in the Baltimore ecosystem and with all the hosp area hospitals and universities and colleges, um, who, like, if we were to introduce you to Carroll Community College, who would you want to talk to at Carroll Community College to, to show them your demonstration? Um, I think most key decision makers are in the Office of Student Affairs and Student Life. Um, if, you know, it is a four-year university, they would have, like, more, um, like bigger university health centers with health promotions teams and like clinical teams. I, I think from what we've noticed in our customer discovery with co uh, community colleges, they tend to be smaller, like, you know, just nursing teams. Um, and so I think then, then it would be mainly student affairs who would be making that decision. Okay, that's perfect. All right, well that, okay. I know exactly who that would be then. And then, uh, so, Likewise, then for community, so for we have a four year college here as well, McDaniel College. And, and so to say again, who would that be? What type of person that would be? Would it be a nursing team, so, you said, or, or no? Yeah, so it would usually be selling to universities is a big lift, right? Because there's a lot of stakeholders and they all want something out of it. Um, so in a four year university, it would usually be the VP of Student Affairs, the director of the counseling center, the director of the health center, um, and a health promotions coordinator. Okay. All right. All right, great. Question. Yes, Rick Lamb. From, from the standpoint of servicing a customer, is there exposure or liability that you may have or that may limit you on, on what you can do you know, via the chat? Um, it limits us in the very near future for our initial pilots um, because we have kept it lean because of compliance. I think we there is a couple of things that we've done on our own back end to ensure that we aren't um, violating, especially HIPAA and FERPA. Um, one of those biggest things being that we don't know which who any of this data belongs to, right? Like we're de-identifying it on our own backend. So there's no risk of student records being leaked and names being um, associated with the kind of health searches that they're having. Um, I think in the chat function, the thing that we're currently trying to figure out is from from when you say like, I, I would like to access this resource to actually scheduling an appointment for that resource or service. Um, how do we, this is a very technical problem, but how do we ensure that if you are clicking on like scheduling that, then it can't be tied to your chatbot conversation in any way. Um, but all of that is covered by our like HIPAA, FERPA, SOC 2 and ISO compliance. Yes, Scott Singleton. Yeah, here. All right, from the college standpoint, I think, you know, their main thing is cost savings, right? I mean, they're providing these services to students. And I'm a question, couple of questions. Are they including this cost of running their centers through tuition and the price to attend college? And um, what, with your services, 
is there a significant savings that you're providing to them? Yeah, that's a great question. In a proper, you know, investor pitch deck, I would talk a lot more about the cost saving and revenues and all of that. Um, yes, there is the cost saving component comes from, I would say the biggest thing is clinician time, right? Being able to see more students. Um, and, you know, right now they only dedicate about 40% of their time to actually being able to see students. The rest of that goes into their like clinical workflows themselves, trying to figure out, you know, what do students need? Health promotions is a big one because they're doing a lot of that um, manual labor, right? To like print out paper and put it on the back of bathroom stalls, right? Or like put it in like freshman dorms, things like that. Um, and so I think that while we want to ensure that clinical teams on at universities are just focusing on giving care and quality of care and nothing else. Um, where that money comes from, it depends on what the university is. Yes, a lot of that would maybe come from tuition. Usually it comes from the state. Um, and there is, you know, usually like an, an endowment <laughs> given and you budget off like how much the university health center would need. I think with our, um, the reason why university health centers care so much about data is because they need to justify how much money they need. And so the better data that they have, the better they can also figure out exactly what it is that students need, you know, two fiscal years in the future. Um, for University of Maryland, something that had caused a lot of outrage last year was they raised the student, um, part of the tuition in students, uh, that's not English. They increased students' tuition to account for an additional um, counseling center fee. And this was mandatory, right? It doesn't matter if you've ever accessed a counseling center. It doesn't matter if you ever plan to. Um, but, you know, if, if they felt like it wasn't enough from the state and they couldn't budget that out far enough, then they took it out of students' pockets. So we want to ensure that that's not something that's happening in the future. Any other questions? I want to know how much it costs. I don't know if that's taboo. Yeah, how but much I mean, does it cost? So I'm assuming that you make money by contracts with the college, they pay you and you provide the service. I mean, is it? Yeah. Um, is it so these initial pilot contracts um, are are smaller. They're just fifty to seventy k um, for the oh, year. Um, something. It also, of course, depends on what the university is. Hopkins and Stanford, for example, have 5,000 students. So do like North Carolina Central and Morgan State, but they're absolutely not the same and won't be paying the same price or something like this. Um, so our pricing takes into account like what the endowment is, how many Pell Grants you have at that university. Um, at a school like Stanford, it would be a, more than 200K for like the entire thing. Um, at a school like um, Morgan State, it would probably be like 120K is, I think, the math. Love it. Impressive. Like it. And so who is, who is reading the data in that dashboard that you showed us? Who is the person at the college or university that is actually analyzing the data and working that's, with it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, at a counseling center, they would have... Um, specified case managers. And this is, you know, part of their clinical staff. And so they would ensure that students are reaching the right resources. But, you know, if you have 30,000 students and like two case managers, um, then, you know, I'm sure you can imagine there, there are a lot of holes and a lot of um, people who, who end up getting dropped off. Um, we are ensuring that there is data for everyone involved, right? There is there is data for student affairs people to look at in order to ensure that like they know what is affecting students at any given time and, and how that affects president's office and administrative decisions. Um, the university health admin administra health administration would care more about cost savings. Um, university health staff would care more about time saving and, and resource allocation. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's like different layers of data for different people. Yeah, excellent. <clears throat> Any questions on Facebook, Kathy? Okay. Any other questions here in the room? Just our final question. Well, yes, our final question is what can we as a community do to help you? Yeah, I mean, um, 
just this was awesome. Thank you for setting up this event. Um, I I think like definitely uh, plugging into more schools in the Maryland ecosystem. We started with Baltimore. Obviously, we started with a couple of HBCUs, but we would love to you know like really see what it looks like in Maryland or the DMV area as a whole. Um, I wonder if it would be different, right, than just the Baltimore area. I wonder if people um, have different social determinants. I also, we're currently raising um, an angel round and are currently part of the SIL. Um, if you accelerator as part of the social innovation lab from Johns Hopkins. Um, and so we're actually taking some impact funding in as well. If anybody knows any angels or impact investors who would be interested, um, happy to send you my contact information. And Oh, and if anybody knows any um, university administration or clinicians, not just for customers, but we are always looking to do more discovery. I think we always have more questions and things that there are to add to this um, to this stack of features. And so, um, yeah, would would of course love to meet them as well. And what's the best way for people to contact you? Yeah, I can. I uh, should have made a contact slide or something. Um, I will put my email and my LinkedIn in the chat. Okay. All right. Yeah. There it is. Ashwarya at meridianhealth.co. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you, Ashwarya. Great presentation. Thank you so much. So we're going to take a moment to reset here, let people get more coffee and baked goods. Thanks again to Americanized uh, Company for providing the coffee and Jeannie Bird for the baked goods. Ashwarya, we will say goodbye to you. Okay, and we will tell our Facebook friends to stay online for any community updates. All right. Thank Have you. a good one, everyone. Bye. She's very good. Wow. All right, we are still streaming. We are going to just move the camera over here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, does anybody have any community updates they want to share? Well, while, while we're just resetting, not right the second. Oh. Yeah, Steve, you do? Okay. I'll call it the Carol Booth. Yes, sir. And Julia said he has an update as well. Okay. Then I can update it. Go on to find a small one around. Facebook. Gabby, do you want to just turn this Zoom off and then reconnect you to Facebook? We have to restart the live stream. That it looks. So it's okay. Fine. Let's we'll see how weird the stream shows. And Julius, would you what page do you want me to pull up? Uh, uh, I don't really know how. Um, um, Go to the uh, is it your office hour? Yeah, go to the office hour. I think it's on. Is that Facebook? Uh, oh, Facebook? Yeah. <clears throat> Under which page? Under the directable system. I think it's like a scan brown. If we don't understand like 90% of the transactions going, but it's windy. Yeah. I mean, this is it's, it's old, but uh, well, you can just keep that up. Yeah. No, I mean, like, I'm like, I'm like I'm I'm not, I'm I'm Tina, will you have anything to share? Yes. Yeah, we've asked something like on the one's fine, I guess. You know, I was watching the I don't know. 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 I don't know.
It's always confused. I think I don't know. Yes, it is. Facebook is behind science. It is. They're constantly. All right. All right, Steve, do you want to get us started with some community? Oh, Morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good here. But it is uh, biz challenge season and full swing. So uh, this year, there's over $17,000 in cash on the table between the grand prize, the People's Choice, and the Change Maker Award, uh, generously provided this year by, again, by United Way of Central Maryland. And uh, the way it works is you have between now and May 31st to submit your amazing new startup idea here in Carroll County. That's really the only criteria. You gotta be 18 and you gotta be starting business in Carroll County or have started within the last year or so. And uh, you apply, it's free to apply. Just for applying, you get all kinds of publicity and meet really cool people if you show up at like meet and greet and stuff like that. And uh, application period ends May 31st at uh, midnight there, 10.59 and 59 seconds. And then uh, there'll be a meet and greet in June at the mall. And then the advisory team, a secret team of support people will gather and they'll go through every single application, every word of it. Oh, yeah, yes, every single application, watch the videos. And those folks have the distinguished and challenging job of picking the five finalists that will pitch their idea here at the live finale on August 3rd at the Carroll Art Center right here in Westminster. And those, the, the, each, each idea, each team or entrepreneur will get five minutes to pitch their idea, seven minutes of grilling by the judges, and then they'll deliberate and decide who gets the $10,000 grand prize. The people in the audience and watching online will decide who gets the $2,023 People's Choice Award, and the Change Maker Award will also be awarded. But that goes to any of the, the United Way picks from all of the applicants, not just the final five. So uh, it's the coolest thing, in my opinion, other than this, of course, that happens in Carroll County, and uh, you should apply. It's a good time. Any hey, questions? Question. Got a question? Yeah. The change maker. Yes, five K. What was it? Before? It is. Uh, I think it was twenty five last year. Was it two thousand twenty? Okay. It, yeah, it's taken a big jump up. Yeah, I mean, if they're the what it's almost people last year. Nothing inflation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing is, out of the 50 people, everybody has a shot. Everybody's got a shot at that. That's good. I mean, the United Way wants to change the world, man. There you go. Right. Impact Carroll County. So there you go. All right. Well, thanks. Thank you, Steve. All right. Julius. All right, um, so uh, just to get a recap from our office hours uh, on March 1st, no, uh, two weeks ago, I apologize, I wasn't here last week to give an update, but I came down with a cold, so thought it best to just stay away. But um, yeah, <laughs> but we had, we had our, our professional office hours, uh, had a good lineup. Uh, unfortunately, didn't quite have the attendance we had from the first office hours. But that's fine. Uh, we did uh, have a good discussion, though, amongst all of the uh, the uh, the panel, if you will. Um, and I wanted to open this up for discussion amongst all the people here, anybody on Facebook Live, um, who might have some some advice. Uh, John John Allen suggested that we um, that we do you know we we, we offer like you know, free assessments of your technology strategy, stuff like that. Uh, and that's that's all fine. But we also, uh, one of our, uh, uh, one of the people who, who came and, and it, uh, it spoke with the panelists, uh, I showed them for, I, I guess it was his first time seeing ChatGPT in action. Uh, so so that was something I, I was I was thinking uh, as, you know, I have now tons of experience uh, using ChatGPT, using GPT-3, GPT-4, by the way, was just released this, I think it was yesterday. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, studying prompt engineering, you know, just learning everything I can about it. And so I'd like to try and share that knowledge uh, with anybody else who might be interested in using that, uh, you know, so that they can, you know, use this tool effectively. So 
that's kind of what I'm what I'm opening up. What kinds of things might the community want to see? Like they they come to to office hours and they want to you know want a quick little fifteen minute primer on how they can you know accelerate their business with this tool or any other. Like what what kinds of things might uh, might you want to see? And you know I understand people might not be might not want to say it out loud here. Or might be too nervous. Um, you know, feel free to drop it in the chat or or send me a catch me afterwards. So. I don't know that I have a specific topic, but I like the idea of a hook like that. Like we're going to talk, we're here to talk general stuff, but this is like sort of a you know fifteen minute little little hook topic mm -hmm. could get people there. I also think that the name, the professional office hour, is 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 a little confusing. Like so I, I understand this. I've heard you talk about it, but I might, I wonder if there'd be like. Some other name that would just be more descriptive, like "Oh, I get what this is," because it kind of sounds like it's when 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 I'm open or when my doctor's office is open, right. you know. And I get it; you're open, I get your right. professional. Off, I get it, right? Um, but I definitely like the idea of the hook. I, I don't the the chat. That's a good. That's a good one. Right. Um, and there's probably we could probably brainstorm another dozen of those. But it's a cool and, idea. And when it comes to the hook, uh, the thing that would like entice me is another hook could be. Here's a case study that we're going to dissect okay. and how does it apply to you? Okay. How can you use this as a lesson so that you're trying whatever you're trying to do to fold with your business? Yeah. We can we can open up this up for you and help you think, think through what you're trying to do. Gotcha. I'll come and talk about why design matters. Yeah. It's like kind of what I care about right now. Yeah. Well, design <laughs> always matters. It's only with you. Uh does it? That's the thing. We need to tell people that it does and tell them why. Yes. It yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, put you in for me. We could do. We could even do a lot like bring your design, and we'll have a good time talking we about roast your design. design. What's that? We just roast, roast your design. design. That's right. Yeah. Design. <laughs> design. design. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, <laughs> there's. Um, well, speaking of the name, uh, when I was in uh, the, the accelerator tech start, they had this thing called Mentor Madness, which was a nice alliteration, and right. it was like. In the course of one week, you met with a hundred mentors and you got all the free advice. And they also warned you you might get mentor whiplash where you get different advice. Right. Yeah. People. But the idea of it being to, to Steve's point about being like a mentorship program that's you know obviously free and providing you know access to these experts on these various topics. There might be something in that in terms of if you are thinking about. Naming it something different, you know, that or just each individual day that you do it has its own hook or an angle specific, right? To okay, a topic, maybe. I don't know, but okay. but I understand what Steve's saying. I kind of agree. I think professional office hours may be a little dry and maybe a little obtuse to most people. Fair enough, yeah, okay. Right. Right. Yeah. You guys are mentors and entrepreneurs. Right, so you can somehow connect that. Yeah, that's good. All right, we're mentors. Yeah, there you go. Any other questions for Julia? I did not. All right, thank you, Julia. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to do a quick uh, update on our next event, which is the Spire Girls Space Science Seminar uh, on March 25th. Again, this is our STEM leadership program for teen girls. Um, I was just reading the Carol Kind Times this morning that Westminster has its own astronomical society. Did anybody else read the Times this morning or see a headline article? And it's like the main picture of like the sort of space. Anyway, they, oh, they yes. do a lot of the they do a lot of um work at Fair Branch. Yeah, on the actually. Right, with the with the little observatory that yes. they've got there. I always wondered they who was using pay. that observatory. Well, apparently it's these guys, and apparently they're one of the largest or most active asteroid or oldest or something. They have some claim to fame uh nationally in terms of being a, a significant astronomical society nationally. In the article, they talk about how people <clears throat> have moved or come to Westminster. To use the observatory at Bear Branch because of the low light pollution here in Carroll County, which is an interesting thing to think about too. Like, how do we preserve that as we kind of build out our ecosystem? You know, 
anyway, if anyone has connections to the Westminster Astronomical Society, I'd love to get in touch with them to also share with them about our space science seminar because we will have uh, Alex Lockwood will be speaking and she is a scientist at the Space Science the Space Telescope Scientist. Thank you, Patty. So it really will be a fun event, very informative, very engaging event. We're really, really excited about it. It will be at Exploration Comics on March 25th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So again, any teen girls that you know who are maybe even slightly interested in STEM or uh, science or space, please let them know about this event. And if you know anyone from the, uh, any, anyone else in general who has a connection to science or astronomy, uh, please connect them with, with magic. Did you have to be a girl when under 18 to go? You have to be a girl. Yes. Yep. You really want so to say, I mean, in the 40s like, or whatever. You know. right. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so <laughs> any other like questions? Okay. And then uh, our last community update, Tina Thomas, you want to come up? Yes. Yeah. I'd like to um, just piggyback on the Spire Girls. To let you know that Alex Lockwood uh, is also a yogi. That's how I first oh. met her um, back prior to the shutdown. And Alex is, was the inspiration for the rainbow be kind sign. When the what? be kind signs were first born, um, we, uh, Eric was just making solid colors like crayons, uh, you know, in the solid colors of the crayon, you know, box. And uh, we had dinner with Alex and she was pregnant and she said, I want a rainbow crayon. I want three rainbow crayons, one for my house and one for each grandparent's house. So no matter where my child is, they will always have a rainbow be kind sign in their world. And if Alex, an astrophysicist, says having the visible spectrum in your life is a positive, important thing, you might want to think about that. You know, having the <laughs> rainbow spectrum in your life as a positive thing so yeah alex is is awesome she's done a ted talk if you have if you know any girl in this in the age range of what is it 14 to, to 8 8th grade to 12th grade 8th grade to 12th grade the high schoolers uh, please sign them up for spire girls because it uh, alex is awesome it's going to be an inspirational day um, i'm sad we're going to miss it we're going to be at maryland day oh. yeah we'll be at power, power plant lot selling maryland becomes yeah. Nice. So um just to give you a, an update in regards to yeah, I know how to, how to spin it. I I track it. Oh no, maybe I'm there. Okay. Yeah, uh, I wanted to share with you that we are off track art. Um we are the guest artists for the month of March. Uh, month of March is also youth art month, and we are featuring signs that others have painted. We're so excited to help them become, you know, uh, artists in residence, so to speak, guest artists at Off Track Art. Um, these two beautiful, magnificent, colorful signs were painted um, by uh, a, I believe, a five-year-old and a nine-year-old, um, and they are featured. They are not for sale. There are others that have been painted by people in the community who, that are for sale, as well as our other signs. So uh, we are having an open house uh, reception on Sunday, this coming Sunday, the 19th, that from noon to four at Off Track Art, right downtown. Um, come take a look at art that others in the community have made and and uh, come um, check out all of the other artists at Off Track Art. Uh, it's a really wonderful space. If you haven't been there, we encourage you to come on down and see it. Any so questions for that, Peter? That's our community update. Yeah, I have a question. I have one more spot for Catapult next week. Can you talk about that? Oh, yes. Yeah, since you fill out the, the song. And sure, absolutely. Uh, Catapult next week uh, after One Million Cups on Wednesday here at Startup Portal. Um, uh, Linda, Linda, Wilner. Linda Wilner is uh, putting on a workshop, Catapult, to help you understand how to storytell and speak uh, for your building your pitch and just trying to understand how to communicate better about what you are trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish so that you can get others on board, so that you can market better your business. And she's going to help me understand how to speak and get rid of my thumbs and and then Henry Mortimer is the will help you tell your story. There we go. And we have storytelling. <laughs> so we have one more opening for that. If you are a business or an entrepreneur and you just kind of need help with your crafting your story, 
Um, so I, what is Catapult? Catapult is her business. Well, it's a connection between Henry and Linda. Oh, okay. Designing their own business around it to basically help people. With storytelling and pitching and, and oh, public okay. speaking. Cool. Yeah, so it's a new entity from them to help people like us, us entrepreneurs here in this entrepreneurial community. So we're grateful for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. So there's one more spotlight for Catapult next Wednesday, which will be right after 1 Million Cups at 1030 here in Startup Portal. So um, give uh, Rick Leinbach and Startup Portal a call if you are interested in filling that last spot. And if there are any more questions, go ahead and lead us out. Oh, absolutely. We want to thank uh, Startup Portal for our space and uh, 1 Million Cups Grand Dodge for uh, magic with <laughs> for bringing one lane cups to us. Uh, let's see, it's uh, the Ides of March. So I have to remind everybody, the sky is not falling and we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And let's all take a collective breath in, let it go, keep moving forward. We'll see you next week. <laughs>